All right. Um, so Mario, first off, we would just like to both Linda and I would really like to thank you and the rest of the organizing committee for inviting us to present at this conference. Uh, we're incredibly honored to be presenting alongside these amazing clinician scientists, uh, many of whom, all of whom I think we've looked up to for many years as uh, physios who've treated patients with ACL injuries and much of their work actually laid the foundation for the group based rehab program we're about to discuss here today. So to be included in the same lineup as them is, I would honestly say nothing short than a dream come true for us. Uh, so thanks for having us here. And before we get into the really exciting stuff, group rehab for ACL injuries, I would like to acknowledge that the group program we will be sharing was held on Treaty 6 territory, the traditional lands of the First Nations and Métis people. I'm also presenting from Treaty 6 territory and Linda is presenting from the unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh Nation. We have no financial disclosures um, to discuss. This is where we insert the joke about giving us something to discuss in the future, potentially, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. As a brief outline, we're gonna go through a little background of who we are, um, why we decided to pursue group rehab, and uh, what the FAST program is all about, which is our group rehab program. And then we'll discuss some of the benefits that we perceive, our patients perceive from the program, and how this all ties into our own PhD research now. So Linda and I, here's a fun fact, actually graduated from the same uh, Masters of Physio program at the University of Alberta in 2011. We're both physiotherapists who have a special interest in treating people with uh, knee injuries and in particular ACL injuries. We worked at the Glen Sather Sports Medicine Clinic at the University of Alberta in Edmonton, Canada, and uh, we led a group rehab program designed for individuals with ACL injuries. We were really fortunate to have the support of orthopedic surgeons, uh, sport med physicians, other physios, kinesiologists, and, and the likes to actually design and run this program as well. Definitely couldn't have done it without them. And ultimately, a lot of our clinical experiences uh, motivated us to pursue research, and we are now slowly, keywords probably slowly, working our way through our PhD um, with our supervisor being Dr. Jackie Whitaker. I'll pass it off to Linda. Thanks, Chris. And as Chris mentioned, we're ACL nerds, and this group rehab program is really our story of how we try to apply what we learned from others and the evidence when rehabilitating ACL injuries. And it also builds on a lot of the work that we've heard from the awesome speakers before us or you will hear today. So this pyramid is just a visual of how we treat ACL injuries 101, but also influence how we designed our group rehab program. Despite our efforts to establish an evidence-based approach to ACL injuries, we were still noticing that patients were still getting conflicting messages about ACL rehab. So for example, return to sport timelines were very different between practitioners. We also wanted an environment that would provide us with a forum to educate patients about the ACL recovery, as well as and making sure it was consistent with the current evidence. As clinicians, we all know that adherence to such a lengthy rehab program is challenging. And so we started to explore, is there another way or strategy to boost motivation and adherence? A recent review by Holt et al. published in Jobs actually found that the social environment, such as group classes, was a facilitator for exercise adherence. And finally, we wanted to develop a safe environment for patients to challenge their knee under supervision. These barriers and challenges actually drove us to develop a group rehab program. The FAST program stands for the Functional Agility and Strength Training Program. And the foundation of this program is that it is group-based rehab. It's informed by the current research and clinical expertise. And our ultimate goal was to foster an environment that promoted shared decision-making, which just really means that the patient learns to develop the autonomy to drive their own rehab. The structure of the program is that it is led by physiotherapists and kinesiologists. Classes were one hour in length and they ran twice a week in six week blocks. There were four levels or stages that had specific criteria or milestones, which we'll discuss later. And each um, class or each level had a 20 minute education session at the very beginning. Level one and two focus on lower body strengthening and levels three and four really emphasize a move towards dynamic and power exercises we start to introduce injury prevention strategies, and our hope is that by the end of level four, they have built the capacity to start to return to training. 
And so this is just uh, kind of an example of a timeline that somebody might go through if they chose to uh, participate in the FAST program. We are seeing most of our participants entering FAST 1, that intro level to strength and conditioning at the two to three month mark, and then subsequently going through these different levels as they're progressing and hitting the criteria that we will um, eventually describe. This is um, not to say it replaces one-on-one -on -one rehab. So there are certain time points where we might have encouraged uh, some of the participants to go back and have chats with the physio, their own physio. Um, this most likely happened when there, if potentially was a flare up in the knee or uh, some other injury that they were dealing with. And it definitely happened between levels three and four, where four is a lot more sport specific, as Linda just mentioned. Um, and we usually encourage our participants to go back to their physios to make sure that level four is actually something that is relevant uh, for them in their rehab. Um, and there also are ongoing visits with their orthopedic surgeon as well. So we're just, again, trying to foster this idea of shared decision making, um, ensuring that our patients are getting feedback from their physiotherapists, kinesiologists, uh, surgeons, and all that stuff before they decide to make that informed decision to return to sport. So because most of our patients had very little experience lifting or what we call the training age of zero and were often recreational athletes, level one was really an introduction to lower body weight training. And the goal here was to really emphasize proper lifting mechanics. We also wanted to improve or increase their confidence in their injured limb. And this was done by improving their single leg strength and neuromuscular control. The criteria to get into FAST 1 was essentially that participants had to have a quiet knee, so um, it wasn't reactive and it didn't look acute, and that they had to have tolerate some lower body um, loading, such as being able to squat with weight or lunging with good technique, and starting to build some confidence doing single leg exercises, such as a single leg squat. The video on the left is an example of a participant in the first few weeks of FAST 1. You can see here she's struggling to maintain equal weight as she's learning to front squat. And then the video on the left is how we use external cues to try to improve her weight distribution. So we actually just put a plate underneath her non-injured leg. We start to introduce hip hinges, hip hinge exercises such as a deadlift to load the hamstrings. And we always incorporate single leg or unilateral exercises such as a lunge. The goals of FAST 1 isn't to get them to lift super heavy, but to get them to learn to lift well and getting patients to understand the importance of strength training. And it's a super big bonus at the end of FAST 1 if they actually learn to love strength training. Um, what we hope to see at the end of FAST 1 is that patients are able to lift at least greater than 35% of their body weight in a three rep max testing in a front squat and a deadlift. The 35% actually doesn't derive from any evidence. It was based off our clinical experience of running the class for several years, and we realized that this objective measure was achievable by almost any patient, um, regardless of their prior training status or prior lifting experience. We then also start to look at single leg squat testing to failure, so getting them to squat down to roughly nine degrees of knee flexion or to a chair height, and we hope to see that they can achieve at least greater than 10 reps bilaterally. And then we start to measure and hope that their limb symmetry index is starting to be greater than 50%. Our psychological goals are that they're starting to understand the importance of goal setting and we get them to set short-term goals so that this can help motivate them. And we start to check their confidence to see, do they feel comfortable doing the tasks that we've asked them? So essentially it's an assessment of self-efficacy. And so that brings us to level two, which is more or less an upgrade onto level one in terms of the strength and conditioning. So we're going after greater strength gains by increasing load and introducing harder exercises like the Nordic hamstring curl. And then we also are starting to introduce some dynamic movements like high knees and jumping, uh, return to jogging at this stage as well. Usually the criteria of each level is the goals of the previous level. So like Linda mentioned, um, we're hoping that people are able to demonstrate a good front squat and deadlift with moderate weight, as well as um, start pushing out some single leg squats on each leg. So one way that we've increased some of the load was by tempo training, as you can see here. So increasing time under tension to hopefully make things more difficult. Just generally asking people to start increasing their weight. Um, so you can see in the photo here that people are starting to toss around a lot heavier weight. 
and then incorporating some different variations of two leg jumps. So at the end of level two, um, our thresholds for the three RM tests have gone up to 80%. And our single leg squat threshold has also gone up to 25 on each side. That's kind of the expectation or the goal and an LSI greater than 80%. Um, I should mention that as like most physios, I would guess out there, we don't have access to an isokinetic dynamometer, unfortunately. We've had a run of a ton of different handheld dynamometers, but for whatever reason, they never stuck. We either lost them, batteries broke, all of that kind of stuff. Um, so we found that these were our three staples that we were always, always able to get done. And we know that there are some limitations with these objective strength measures, but um, it was uh, the best that we had available with our resources. There's still no agility tests necessarily. We're just looking for technique as they're going into more dynamic exercises, as well as checking in with their confidence, as Linda mentioned, as they're progressing into new dynamic exercises and constantly encouraging that goal setting idea. So now we move on to FAST3, which is a shift towards more dynamic movements or what we call high risk movements. These are usually mechanisms or movements that the participants may have injured their ACL in. We build on what we've done in FAST2, and we start to make sure that the two-legged jumps are more explosive or more demanding, and we shift towards introducing one-leg jumps. We start to really try to integrate injury prevention program. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, uh, specifically, we teach them how to do the 11 plus, and we're always encouraging them to maintain lower body strengthening. The criteria to get into FAST3 is what Chris mentioned earlier, is the same goals that we've set in FAST2, uh, making sure that they've had this baseline of strength um, but we now expect them to be able to jog for at least 10 minutes at a moderate intensity because FAST3 has a much more cardiovascular or much more higher cardiovascular demand. This is a video of how we teach our change of direction. Again, we really like to use external cues. Start to introduce dynamic single leg exercises such as a drop down single leg jump. And then we try to incorporate all of this together into a combo of movements, which we feel is a little bit more sport specific and pushes towards a little bit more cognitive effort. Although return to sport is a goal for many of our patients, we always try to emphasize injury prevention. We have incorporated the 11 plus as part of our class warm up. A shout out to Marlon and his team for doing such amazing work on this program. And here's an example of our sled push. We're always looking at fun ways to try to push our patients to strengthen um, with the resources that we have. And so that's just a six foot six volleyball player casually hanging out on that sled push. So at the end of fast three, we're hoping that their strength goals are similar to fast two so that they're either surpassing, uh, maintaining or surpassing those goals. We start looking at their technique check and just making sure that they are proficient in their running, their jumping, and their change of direction drills. We objectively start to measure their jumps or their hops. So for their two leg broad jumps, we like to see they can jump at least greater than 75% of their height and their one leg jumps are starting to get greater than 80% of the LSI. And then for our psychological goals, we start to look at, we always maintain that goal setting, but when we're checking their confidence, we're seeing how do they feel, especially with these high risk movements, as, um, as this can start to indicate, do they have re-injury anxiety or just um, anxious about these um, a certain movement. And then we start to measure their psychological readiness to return to sport using the ACL RSI. We don't have an objective cutoff. The goal of the ACL RSI at this point is just a baseline and potentially a conversation starter. But as they move towards fast forward, we do hope to see that the numbers are changing and improving. And that takes us into the fast four, which is our final level of the program. Um, and I would say is the one that Linda and I probably enjoy running the most because we can start introducing a lot of these sports specific drills. So we start adding a lot of reaction decision making into them. Um, we increase the level of competitiveness. So hopefully that means that they're starting to fly around at higher speeds as well. Simultaneously, we are also looking at emphasizing injury prevention. Um, so we're continuing to do the 11 plus and trying to plant a little bit of a seed about considering their long-term knee health as well. Again, the criteria to get into level four is the same as the goals from level three. We're looking for good technique with change in direction and jumping, as well as that 80% LSI for the single leg broad jump. So this is one way of adding in some reaction. Um, so that's Maggie, our kinesiologist, just stepping to the right or the left of a cone and participants are meant to go 
the opposite direction of her and uh, she always put her her line in the butt or sacrificed her body in the line of work so we appreciate that uh, and then we also start increasing our angles for change in direction techniques for change in direction and speed as uh, Tristan is kind of demonstrating here with that lateral cut and then we get into the really fun stuff. So some shadow drills where um, you're just having to be aware of what else is going on in your environment, the other bodies in your environment. And we start increasing that level of competition by doing some flag football drills and uh, working on that defensive maneuver as Holly was mentioning, um, there is a, a little bit of a greater risk of tearing an ACL in a non-contact fashion when we're on defense rather than offense. So we start working on some 2v1s and 3v2 type situations. In general, fast four is just so much fun. Uh, I think we ha always have a blast with it and I would reckon that our patients would say the same. We always end off fast four with dodgeball, which is the ultimate chaos. If you think about that chaos control continuum. Uh, for us, it was really great to see that our patients are able to go and just pop themselves right into this activity without really thinking about what uh, their knee was doing and feel confident and comfortable doing so. And it was always fun for us to watch and hopefully not get hit either. So at the end of level four, the goals are the same for the strength um, outcomes. And then we have now added in a few different other single leg hops, uh, jumps from mostly taken from Ali Gokler's paper in 2017. And we have increased that LSI threshold to 90% now for our any single leg um, type of movements, whether it's jump or agility. And as Linda was mentioning, we actually do have a cutoff for our ACL RSI now, which is 80. Uh, we're hoping that all of our participants are scoring over 80, which indicates that they should be psychologically ready to return to sport if they haven't uh, started training already. So hopefully what you're taking home from those videos is that uh, the biggest benefit to this program is that it's a lot of fun. Um, I would maybe argue more for us than for our participants. As a close second, uh, social support was such a huge benefit for all of our participants. I think we really were able to develop this feeling of a community, which was pretty incredible. It's always a little bit easier to get through that long, arduous ACL rehab, knowing that there's other people around you that are kind of going through the same trials and tribulations. Um, a lot of our patients always mention this idea of accountability. So knowing that they had to show up two times a week uh, to do their exercises really boosted adherence. And because most of them were also recreational athletes, having access to gym equipment and space was also um, a big plus. I'd say a little bit maybe more from our perspective as clinicians, being able to create this safe environment so that people can test their knee limits and ask us questions was always uh, a nice thing to have, as well as that same idea that Linda mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, having um, some consistent feedback. So always hopefully trying to nudge them in the right direction. Plus everybody got t-shirts. So this is actually Wendy, who is one of our participants that went through the whole program after she had an ACL injury. Uh, she actually designed all these little wolf cartoons and they, she kind of drew how she felt at the end or during each of the levels. So we commissioned her and we got her little drawings and we put them on t-shirts and now everybody gets a t-shirt with uh, whatever level wolf on it when they complete the level. And we're actually wearing ours right now. So there you go. <laughs> so it's a nice little patient collaboration there. Uh, this is Tristan. He went through the whole program and I'll kind of let him talk about his own experiences. Oh, there's no volume. There's no volume. Okay, well, essentially he's just saying really nice things about us. <laughs> we can upload the video later. Um, the joke was that we didn't bribe him to say any of these things, but uh, he's only saying wonderful things, we promise. 
So that kind of takes us all to our research. Um, and a lot of these experiences, interactions with our patients kind of motivated us to get after our PhD. And we obviously really love knees and we've been fortunate to travel around the world and meet a lot of great people. Um, also have some incredible support back home as well. So having said that, I'm gonna let Linda get into her PhD uh, topic. Thanks, Chris. And obviously there's a lot of photos in that previous slide. So just telling you guys that we have been on this PhD journey for maybe far too long. Um, so it's no surprise that after spending so many years and pretty much a big chunk of my clinical career trying to build this program, that uh, my PhD will actually look at social support following a sport related knee injury, but particularly an ACL injury. Um, so social support can be defined as the social relationships or interactions that aim to improve health and well being. And so I had this question about whether we can leverage those relationships or interactions so that we can re promote recovery after an ACL injury. So my PhD will be looking at answering three questions. Uh, the first is that I would like to look would like to look to answer what are the social support needs of individuals with sport related knee injuries and some of this find these findings are already published in a review in BJSM this year and we're also going to explore this through some qualitative studies. Secondly, I would like to look at what are the social relationships that patient identify as important. So is there a value in having patients uh, meet with other injured athletes or what we call a mentor. So someone who's been through the ACL journey and successfully recovered. Um, if we connect those two, um, what's the benefit of that? And lastly, I'm going to exploring the relationship between social support and recovery outcomes, such as self-reported adherence. And um, this is going to be embedded in a pilot RCT done out of the University of British Columbia. And this RCT is actually going to be looking at an online group program with weekly group classes. And I think um, it's gonna be kind of very interesting because I think social support is actually what we do as clinicians. Maybe just this will shift us to be a little bit more intentional, intentional about it when we're treating ACL injuries. And my research is embedded in health-related quality of life following a youth sport-related knee injury. So health-related quality of life being the construct that encompasses the physical, psychological, and social domains of health um, through a lot of my interactions with those participants at FAST and then also having undergone my own ACL journey a few years ago, um, I kind of had this aha epiphany moment that maybe we should be re redefining success after any injury to include something a little bit more holistic like health really quality of life uh, and think a little bit beyond that return to sport piece. So. My first research question was to look for the best health related quality of life patient reported outcome measure that can, we can use in an active youth population. That's uh, done also through a systematic review that I've just actually submitted recently. Fingers crossed there. And then I'm also looking at how does health related quality of life change after a youth sport related knee injury and what physical, psychological and social factors may influence health related quality of life uh, after that injury as well. Uh, so these two questions will hopefully be answered using data from a couple different prospective cohort studies with match controls at the University of Alberta and the University of Calgary. So the big take home message from our talk today is videos are fun in a presentation first and foremost, but also that group programs are a viable and exciting alternative for ACL rehab. The foundation of any rehab that you decide to do, whether it's group based or whether it's one on one, should always be in evidence based practice and shared decision making. Uh, and I would argue that that's probably something that's relevant for all rehab. One of the advantages is that by doing the group rehab programs, we were able to address the physical, the psychological, and the social components of recovery, which I found as a clinician really hard to do one-on-one, -on -one, but it was great to see that this was achievable through a group program. And then this is my final plug, I promise, for thinking about the long game, so thinking beyond return to sport and how do we help out with that long-term health knee piece. So minimizing the risk of re-injury using injury prevention programs like Holly was talking about, minimizing the risk of developing post-traumatic osteoarthritis, which is primarily um, the work of our supervisor, Dr. Jackie Whitaker, and then thinking about how can we optimize health-related quality of life. 
And finally, our main focus is always empowering the patient. And we found that being in constant communication with the patient in the group environment, we were able to build a really strong therapeutic relationship. And this allowed the patient to slowly feel more confident to take control of their own knee health. And so with that, we'd just like to say thanks. So thanks to all of our amazing kids that helped, uh, helped us run the program, all of our colleagues that uh, we worked with at the Glen Sather Sports Medicine Clinic, and of course, our incredible research team um, as well. And, and obviously our amazing FAST participants.